Hi everyone, welcome back to Project Happy Home. For those of you who are new here, I'm Tanya, a doctor lawyer turned homeschooling mom of three kids ages 8, 5, and 3. My 8 year old will be a rising 3rd grader next year and one of the many pieces of language arts for him next year will be the language arts and literature level 3 course from the good and the beautiful. We are eclectic homeschoolers, we are secular homeschoolers, but there's an emphasis on the eclectic and we like to use a lot of different materials. I had hoped to be using um, the good and the beautiful as a main part of our curricula, but we will not be doing that and I will get into why later on in this video. The way I'll structure this video is initially I'll show you the pieces of the curriculum, what I think is good and bad about it on an academic level, and then we'll get into uh, how much tweaking might be required for a secular homeschooler, etc. And as I've mentioned in all my previous videos about the good and the beautiful, um, I realize that the definition of a secular homeschooler really does vary across the board all the way from people who are religious, who might even be Christian, who prefer to have no religion involved in their academic materials, to people who are religious but not Christian, who don't want to have Christian um, doctrine in their academic materials, all the way down to more spiritual people who don't mind the mention of God, and then people who are atheist or agnostic or just incredibly insistent upon the fact that there be no reference to God in the curriculum. Um, with that being understood, I'm going to try to give you a clear picture of how much tweaking would be necessary based on how often they reference Christianity and Christian doctrine within this curricula. And so if you have particular opinions about a secular homeschooler using a Christian curricula, please refrain. I mean, I think that that's really a personal choice on many levels for anyone, no matter what your religion is. So. The whole purpose of these videos is to assist you in your purchasing decisions. Okay, so we'll get into the different pieces of the curriculum. As you can see here, you get a giant course book, which is really quite hefty and bound, and it's a nice sturdy binding, so you don't really have to worry about it falling apart on you. And then you also get these little coil bound um, or spiral bound readers, which have illustrations in them that are, that are black and white, as you can see. So there's two of those and the giant course book, which has all the worksheets and the teacher instruction inside it. There is a course companion that comes with level three, which is an interesting um, little book. It has like recommended methods for practicing spelling. It has your spelling lists in there, spelling rules, um, the poems that they suggest for memorization. I actually really like the fact that they pulled this out as a separate course book. There's also a little glossary because it makes it really easy for you, especially if you keep like a teacher binder or you just um, want to have something on the side. In addition, level three also comes with a set of flashcards, which I actually haven't even unpacked yet, but they are not perforated as far as I can tell. So you do have to like cut them apart yourself, but they're printed on nice dirty cardstock and it's, it is a nice addition to the curriculum. As in my previous videos for the good and the beautiful, I have flagged all the instances that I think might be objectionable to a secular homeschooler and we'll go through those later but first of all let me just walk you through um, the scope and sequence of the curricula. As you can see the curriculum is formatted beautifully everything is really elegant and beautiful to look at. It begins with level three at a glance and it talks about how it goes through grammar usage and punctuation including alphabetical order capitalization editing verbs commas sentence diagramming sentence types, synonyms and antonyms, etc. There is a section on geography and art, and this is one of the features of The Good and the Beautiful that really appealed to me. I love the idea of incorporating geography and art into your study of language arts because I find it to be a really good fit. In phonics, reading, literature, and writing, you have a lot of things ranging from homophones to poetry memorization to poetry writing, sensory language. It talks about a lot of the odd little rules about English, like the silent E, the silent H, um, high frequency spelling rules, and it also talks about writing. So writing a personal narrative, writing an opinion essay, writing letters, writing thank you notes, etc. If you've watched my videos, by the way, one of the things I think we've always done right in my homeschool, and there's plenty that I think we could have tweaked earlier, is that we do mail Mondays. And so on Monday, we always write a letter or a note or a card to a friend or family member or just a pen pal. And um, it's just a nice way for my kids to understand the purpose of writing. Why do we want to learn how to write? Why do we want to learn how to form letters neatly? Why do we want to convey our ideas? And it's so fun for them because these people will write back. And so they have like an immediate positive association with the very act of writing and putting their ideas on paper. 
So if you haven't started something like that, I really recommend it. It's a nice practical way of integrating writing into your daily life. So then it goes on to the table of contents and you have the lessons and the lessons go from one to 130. So you have four pages of the table of contents and it's very, very clear. So if you are the type of eclectic homeschooler that likes to jump around in a curricula, or if you're using this as a supplement, it makes it quite easy because for example, in your base curricula, if you're studying open syllables, you can just go through here and see, oh, okay, lesson eight is open syllables. I'll go to that and do that lesson. And I very much like that about it. If you just wanted to do the artwork lessons, it's very easy to find because they label it as artwork. Or for example, the geography lessons are labeled as geography. I very much like the clear layout of this curricula. As I've said before, there is something to be said for using a curricula that is laid out in such an easy and beautiful manner. Everyone I think can appreciate beautiful formatting. So then it goes on to a section about this course. And as in every other level, it does emphasize that the good and the beautiful is about God, family, nature, and high moral character. And as a secular homeschooler trying to use this curriculum, I do want to emphasize that I am completely aware of the fact that this is designed to be a curriculum for Christians espousing Christian doctrine. I'm just trying to show you how you could tweak it if you are in fact a secular homeschooler because I'm of the opinion that the quality of a curriculum isn't necessarily decreased by the fact that there is a religious doctrine underlying it, especially when the subject is not science. Um, I personally draw the line at using science curricula developed by Christian companies because it's easy to get into the weeds about um, questions about evolution, frankly and uh, other things about anatomy and physiology and the development of the human body, etc. For language arts though, I was willing to give it a go. It's very nicely laid out. It talks about the, the pieces of the curricula, whether it follows common core or not, the items needed for the course, um, level three readers. The book that is suggested with the course, that's integrated with the course, is A Penny's Worth of Character by Jesse Stewart. Mm -hmm. And it says that you need a highlighter or tracing paper, books for the reading challenges, that's two different pages here, and my book of stories and writings. If you go to page 106, you'll see one of those reading challenges. For example, lesson 37, you have a reading challenge for biography. So you tell the child what a biography is and you have the child read any one of the biographies that they list below here. For example, Helen Keller or The Sir Courage of Sarah Noble, Benjamin Franklin, George Washington. Um, you know, and I like the idea of integrating that. I like the fact that a curricula like this reminds you to do this. And the curricula has a section on how to teach this course. So you're supposed to practice your spelling words for five to 10 minutes a day, practice challenging word flashcards, those white flashcards that I showed you earlier for about five minutes, have the child complete personal reading in the level three reader for 20 minutes complete 30 to 45 minutes in the course book with the child. And of course, that is up to you in terms of how much you're going to do. Because as I said, there's about 130 lessons in this book. So technically you could do it just in school days. You can just do a lesson per school day, but some lessons will go faster than others. So I actually appreciate the fact that they, they organize it by time rather than lesson number. You can work on poetry memorization one or two times a week as well. And they suggest that the total daily time will be 60 to 90 minutes and that'll depend on your child's tolerance as well as their skill level. There is a course reading assessment at the beginning of the book and basically what you're supposed to do is have the child read the passage and, and you keep track of the time. And then as they read it, you mark the incorrect words that they say. At the end of the course, they'll do the same thing and hopefully you should see improvement. Lesson one starts with commas in a series. And I just want to reiterate that it's amazing that the good and the beautiful makes the entire curriculum available for preview as a PDF and also for purchase, I think for levels one through five. So you can really see every single page of it before deciding to buy it, or you can simply download it and print it yourself. There is no reason to be surprised and you can definitely go through it and see how much tweaking is needed for yourself, but I've done the work, so I'll show you. I'm gonna go through the layout of lesson one just to show you kind of how the good and the beautiful is structured. They have text in different colors throughout the page. So for here, for example, you can see four colors already, the blue, the black, the red, and the green. Here you have in the blue, almost like a teacher's guide, things that the curricula is saying to you as the parent. And then it'll say here, for example, in blue, read to the child. The black is text that you're going to read aloud to the child. Examples are often put in red in this textbook. And then you have reading practice here. It says, read the following poems to your parent or teacher. So the green is an actual direction to the student themselves. 
again that's nice it's very clear in labeling out when there is a worksheet or something it'll bold it so that you know that you are going to be doing that there's many things in the curricula that you write on a board or a separate um, area so that you can involve multiple different um, media and everything when you do this curricula the art study is in full color it's a really nice addition to the curricula and so here's that worksheet that they mentioned, commas in a series. And they're very clear and nicely oriented. Instructions are in green so the student can tell where... Mama, this is my blanket. I'm sorry, baby. I'm using your blanket underneath the curricula. Because it looks nice in the video. Is that okay? I'll give it back to you later, okay? Mm -hmm. Thank you, sweetie. You like it? I do like it. I made it for you. So I'm just going to flip through to show you some more of the um, lessons, and then we'll get into the secular tweaking. As you can see, it's really lovely the way it's organized. Here is an artwork lesson that's sort of combined with a geography connection, which is also a really nice feature. So here you have some labeling, label Norway, Finland, and Sweden. There's my little three-year-old's hand because she's joined us. You wanna say hi? Say hi. Hi. <laughs> Sorry for that interruption, you guys. Those of you with preschoolers know how it is. Um, again, so here's another piece of artwork from the book. They're really beautiful paintings and, you know, I appreciate the, the inclusion of like artwork scattered throughout the curriculum very much. Here you have possessive nouns. The lessons are in short and sweet and simple and I like that. They do not beat the child over the head with, in, you know, impossible amounts of repetition. Something about another painter. It is relating it to geography though, which is nice. There's quite a lot of art in the beginning and it continues on through. Here it starts with poetry writing. I like the fact that it gives the children sort of like a scaffolding for poetry writing so it doesn't just turn them loose at the very beginning. It suggests like how to create rhyming structure etc. Here you have a discussion of countries and then an explanation of the United States. Here's another painting and art study to review. Here's some editing to do. I like that it's in cursive. At this point, a lot of our children are working on cursive, so this is a way for them to practice reading it. This is a really lovely painting in its own right. I love the fact that they include art that includes not only uh, people of fair skin. Um, here you have a section on adverbs, and of course you have the Christina Rossetti poem, which for those of you who do first language lessons will recognize because it's the first poem you memorize in that curricula. You have some sentence diagramming. Again, it's slow and steady, so you have a very simple beginning, and then you only have three or four examples for the children to fill in. A discussion of continents, some spelling rules again. Um, it does talk about memorizing rules, so like one syllable plus one vowel followed by one consonant at the end, double the consonant when adding and ending starting with a vowel. I have opinions about spelling rules. Those um, opinions might shift as I learn more about how my children are with spelling. Right now, basically what we do is I let my children spell how they like, and if I notice that they're misspelling a word consistently, um, we'll just write that word down four or five times, and we'll just sort of alert them to it. But for me at this stage, it's more important to capture their ideas and the quality of their ideas and encourage them to write. So I tend to shy away from editing them too much at this stage. And honestly, uh, for my son at least, he is a fairly good speller. Uh, discussion of the equator. Again, some more diagramming of sentences. Editing a story. Here's learning to practice with poetry. So here they ask them to read it to the teacher and then highlight their favorite line of the poem or circle their favorite poem in the collection. Um, again, I like that. It's a very gentle way of introducing like a personal relationship to the poem. It's not so necessarily asking the theme of the poem or anything heavy at the beginning. It's encouraging a relationship to the poem with the child. And if you have a poem in here which is um, too Christian for you, I think it's a really easy thing to substitute with another or to simply not use that poem. Here you have a Japanese lantern. I like how they are associating relevant art with the lesson. I think it's a really beautiful part of the curriculum. I, I cannot deny that. Uh, as it goes on, you'll see there's a lot of emphasis on 
poems and sentence diagramming, prefixes, suffixes. I like how they do a lot of different color coding in this book so that it's easy for the child to tell where the lesson is, where the thing is to read aloud, etc. But I hope you can get an idea of how it's going. There's different activities to do. There's some areas where the students are writing down things, for example here. There's some areas where they're circling or highlighting. Um, it's not just the same activity over and over again, which I think is really helpful. There's some poem reading with inflection, which is nice, where they practice that. You have the nativity here, and then more reviews and more reviews. And when you get to the end of the book, the course book is actually a total of about 357 pages. So you can see as far as um, an academic course, I think it's actually a really nice course. I think it progresses in a really orderly fashion through many of the things that an average third year old would be learning. And I also really appreciate how they incorporate geography and art so seamlessly throughout. On the other hand, I had serious reservations about making this a core part of our curriculum after seeing one the incredible uh, increase in Christian doctrine in this book from level one, for example, and two, the emphasis on not reading twaddle in this book. If you'll remember in level one, there was in the intro and then I think one or two lessons where they discuss how twaddle isn't good for you. And it's very mild and that discussion is basically in the teacher guide portion of the text and the lesson. So it's very easy to avoid getting into it with your student. In contrast, in level three, the amount of Christian doctrine and discussion about how twaddle is horrible and only quality literature is worth reading is markedly, markedly increased and is directed much more strongly towards a student. So in my opinion, level three requires so much tweaking that if I had known that in the beginning, I would have avoided it completely. That being said, now we have it, and I am an eclectic homeschooler, and I do like using the materials that I purchase, and I see a lot of value in this book, so I will attempt to integrate it into our coursework, though our core curriculum will be a different curricula, which I will be doing a video for later. Everywhere I have a yellow flag, if you can see the flags, this is basically a mention of religion. Um, or God or Christianity. For example, here it talks about God as the master architect of nature. These are simple mentions of God that really do not upset me personally as someone who believes in God but happens to be a secular homeschooler. And as I had mentioned in level one, almost every single art study in this book involves a mention of God because they very much like to repeat that God gave us um, art, God gave us the beautiful things in the world, God created the beautiful things in the world. Um, they repeat the phrase God's beautiful world quite a bit when you're talking about art study. Again, those are all mild things to me, uh, but you might have a significant issue with them. And then when you get into lesson four, you have what makes a book worth reading. Now this is the first twaddle lesson, and if you'll notice it has a purple flag because honestly this bothers me more <laughs> than the mentions of God in this curricula. It really takes a strong, strong stance on how it is very important to only read quality literature. I, I disagree with this on a very deep level. In fact, I would argue that it's very important for children to read some twaddle. I will go out on that limb, and the reason is because there is a lot of twaddle where the characters are imperfect. I think there's definitely a line between completely inappropriate literature or literature that glorifies violence or uh, misbehavior, etc., from literature that simply shows children exhibiting um, childlike characteristics that might need correction but are appropriate to their level of development. And I think if you only expose your child to books and stories where children are acting perfectly, that actually is very isolating for them and can teach them that their normal reactions, their reactions to hit a sibling or um, talk back or fight with their brother, et cetera, or all those things are normal parts of childhood. They're normal parts of learning right and wrong. And there's a a way of learning about it from an empathetic perspective as well, not simply by learning about it from model characters who do the right thing or are disciplined the right way, etc. I think life can be messy and I think shielding children from that for a very long period of time can be damaging. I think 
it is reassuring to have characters in books share somewhat petty feelings. I think we are all imperfect and seeing that reflected in a fictional character even as a child can be really soothing. I'm not so bad, this is normal. And then usually the story resolves itself and the lesson is learned anyway, even in Twaddle. So that's my little plug for Twaddle right there. And I also think that allowing your child to read what they want to read allows them to learn how to enjoy reading and to remember the feeling and the thrill of reading instead of just slogging through it. So definitely there's a balance there, but that's my opinion on Twaddle. And I really disliked the holder than thou attitude that this curricula takes towards Twaddle and it just bothered me intensely. They also relate that dislike of Twaddle back to Christ's teachings. Christ taught us to be kind to others, to seek learning, to be respectful, to be clean, and to be organized. And they call out specific books that your children might like. Big Nate teaches that it is funny, cool, and acceptable to be unclean and disorganized, to be unkind, to be disrespectful, and to think learning is boring and unimportant. Now I haven't read this particular book, so I can't speak to it one way or the other, but I do think that taking a hard line about a book in this way is never that useful. I think even in books where you have negative characteristics or negative characters, um, there is value in the discussion about why that's good or bad, etc. Uh, but here you have lessons. What makes a book worth reading? And this was something I just had a huge problem with because that is fine if you leave it as a free form lesson and the child can develop their own opinions. But when you are force feeding a child why a book is worthwhile and that worthwhile books can bless your life, etc. I have real exception to that especially as a child, it's very hard for you to form your own likes and interests in reading if it's always being selected for you. So and just to let you know, I'm not going to go through every single one of my yellow flags because they are very similar to the level one issues. Um, for example, here, Geography God's Plan for Our World is right at the top of this. It says, our world is a beautiful, complex creation, perfect for human life, designed and made by God. So again, it, honestly, this level just does get much more religious than the older levels. It also specifically calls out people who do not believe in God say the world was created by accident. I take great exception to that statement. Um, that's simply untrue. I don't think accident really encompasses the beautiful story of uh, evolution, but that being said, um, I take exception to language like that. So as a secular homeschooler, I will say, I found much more to irritate me in this level than in the prior level one and primer. Um, again, you have here, the great map maker is the poem and all the world is God's grand design. Um, he is the greatest map maker that has ever been. Another purple flag, you guys. Here we have lesson 27, the good and the beautiful book, A Penny's Worth of Character. They highlight the fact that A Penny's Worth of Character is um, like such an exceptional book which it very well might be. The thing that I don't like about it, again, is that it gets into a comparison with The Dork Diaries. Again, another series that I have no experience with. But it talks about how The Dork Diaries has only bad messages and all bad messages come from Satan. It is important that we do not read things that have bad messages. Nothing we read should encourage us to become less like Christ. Um, if you are not a Christian homeschooler, all of this rhetoric can be really over the top and so you really do have to pick and choose lessons for example this entire lesson i am just going to skip um, and then it talks about what messages in our are in a book and good messages and bad messages you know i agree with the list i just don't agree <laughs> with the fact that they kind of say that the dork diaries is bad in every single way and that it doesn't have any good values i find that a little bit hard to believe that being said i have not read um the book it even emphasizes it just in case you miss the chart it says none of the good messages on this chart are given in dork diaries not even once in fact no good messages are found in the book i think sometimes the contrast with good behavior can be just as informative about what good behavior should be as a book where the characters are just goody two-shoes so again you can probably tell that i really dislike 
all of their emphasis on good books versus bad books. Books are just books and if they're written poorly I don't like them but there's a lot to be said for engaging a child at the age and stage at which they are at. Children are not tiny adults. They are not meant to be. They are each at their own individual stages with their own silly sense of humor. Um, the amount of times my children say jokes about butts cannot be counted. I mean, if I only had a nickel every time. And honestly, sometimes I think, well, it would be wonderful if I never had to hear a joke about a butt, but half the time I laugh. And to me, laughter is the most wonderful thing. And it doesn't matter what that laughter was about so long it, as it wasn't harming anyone else or making fun of anyone else. So as we go on through, again, there's references. This is my father's world. Again, as a Christian curricula, you can expect references to Christianity. There are several um, poems, for example, that reference God and generally about the world, God's great design. Here you have God's care of animals. You know, there are lots of religious compositions of music and lots of religious poetry that I find quite beautiful from many different religions across the board. So I'm not offended at all by poetry mentioning God, honestly. And that again is just a level of tolerance and what type of secular homeschooler I am. That will vary across the board. The whole purpose of this video is to let you know what's in it so that you can decide for yourself whether it's appropriate for you or not. As I mentioned, almost every art lesson talks about God's creations. That does not, by the way, make the art lesson any less valuable or the painting less beautiful for the child to see. Isn't that sweet? But I see another purple flag. <laughs> So let's go to it to show you. Ah, the father-mother thing. This curricula does have, just like the level one, a lot of sort of gender um, standards about what a father does and what a mother does, what a father's duty is, what a mother's duty is. That can really get a little bit muddy for me because I tend to view both parents in much more of an equal light, though fathers and mothers are definitely different. I don't know that I exactly agree with what they say here. For example, the father's duty is to foster the happiness, prosperity, and well-being of each family member. I would say that's the mother's duty too. It is the mother's influence during the crucial formative years that forms a child's basic character. Home is the place where a child learns faith, feels love, and thereby learns from a mother's loving example to choose righteousness. That's fine, but I also think you could say it's the father's influence during the crucial formative years that forms a child's basic character as well. Um, I think both definitions kind of denigrate the other role. So this denigrates the father's role in, in this, and this statement denigrates the mother's role in the happiness, prosperity, and well-being. But I just thought I would point it out because it annoyed me. Here you have some mentions of God in poetry again. Um, God is truly the master creator of beauty. God designed the earth this way and it is perfect for human life. Again, there's a lot of similar statements about that, so that's really your own level of tolerance. Here in this art analysis, they actually talk about proverbs and they just bring in more religion into this edition, as I said. So here you have a section from Isaiah 28.10, um, teaches us that we learn line upon line here a little and there a little. Again, I think that's lovely. I think um, it's perfectly fine to include different sections of scripture, especially when it's not in a doctrinal kind of way, but more in a, in a teaching beauty and appreciation and goodness kind of way. Um, I find much more uh, wrong with their emphasis on not reading twaddle and separating books out into good and bad, etc. than any of this. Here's another poem, God Make My Life a Little Light. As you can see, there's quite a few purple flags coming up, so I'm actually just going to focus on those. In Lesson 101, The Goose Quill, I have a serious issue with the discussion they engage in about how education in America changed in the late 1900s when God and character were removed from public education. Um, this really hinges upon what you believe about religious freedom in a federally funded educational institution and how much respect you have of, for people with different religious views. When you have a federally funded program that is teaching children of many different faiths and religions, I think it's quite reasonable to separate out uh, one particular rig religion from 
the academic curricula. And I think that there are probably ways in which you could preserve spirituality in schools, especially if you left it open-ended. But here, I don't believe that's what they're talking about. I think it's they are specifically talking about the removal of Christianity from public education. And to me, that's just an ideological stumbling block there. So that's another lesson we will be skipping. Here you have in Lesson 104, the Writer's Workshop, read to the child, let's imagine your school's putting on a children's play that has a lot of profanity, write a Christ-like letter to the imaginary principal expressing your concerns, use the format shown below. Again, I have different views on profanity and the word Christ-like um, than the author of this curricula. I think there is excellent literature and <laughs> excellent plays, etc., that involve quite a bit of profanity because they illustrate sociological issues that involve profanity and people who use profanity. And again, I think we give words meaning and the way in which words are used is very relevant to what we take away from them. And if we blanket make a certain word or a certain person or a certain faith bad and good, the separation of things so clearly into black and white, bad and good, I think therein lies a danger in not seeing people first. In my personal view, I think nothing is really black and white and there is a lot of nuance to life and especially in language arts, I want to emphasize that nuance to my children as soon as possible. Here you have uh, poetry from McGuffey's Readers, number one. Here they have another thing about McGuffey's Readers and the Golden Rule, which I think is lovely because, I mean, doesn't it all boil down to the Golden Rule? Uh, apparently they don't think that though when they talk about the Dork Diaries, so that's just me. Here you have lesson 112, reading comprehension, McGuffey's readers. Again, same type of discussion. Everything is just very painted with a brush of that was good and this is bad and I just don't like it. But it does teach you about McGuffey, which is kind of cool. And then you have these longer stories at the end, which have multiple parts. So they do have reference to God. Here um, they have reference to redemption and things like that. So just be aware of that. But I did try to flag every single mention I saw. So if you can see here, this is about the level of tweaking you are dealing with. And it's not insignificant, but there are several purple flags in there. And I just wanted you to be aware of this emphasis on Christian doctrine that was missing, I believe in level one. One of the concerns I have with this increase in doctrine is, when I say doctrine, I mean both about the Christian doctrine as well as the the rhetoric about twaddle, is that my son is a very strong reader and he can read the teacher guide portions in this book because it's not really separated out and he almost naturally will. And he is still at this age where it is difficult for him to parse sometimes in an official textbook capacity what is up for interpretation and what is not. And there are certain things that are said in a very authoritative manner in level three that I do not agree with at all and I would rather my son not see. So whereas in the level one course book there's very few instances where I would really take a sharpie or skip a lesson, in here there are quite a few lessons that I am going to skip, at least four or five, and there are quite a few instances where I'm just going to take a sharpie to the page so that reading something is just not an issue. The readers themselves are quite nice. Again, they're a little bit goody two-shoes for me. Uh, they're not my favorites in terms of readers, especially for a third grader, but the stories are lovely. There's nothing really ex um, objectionable in them. And as if you can see, the mentions of God and religion are rather few. And the stories are really cute. I think in some ways that this depends on the child. Um, if you have a child that really likes prairie stories and stories about the Amish, etc., this would really work for you. My son, I don't know how it's going to go, honestly. I think he might get bored with some of the stories, but some of the stories he will like quite a bit. So it's a mixed bag for me. Here, I'm going to show you again in the second half, not that many mentions of God and religion, but there is one purple flag. So let's see what I said. Ah, this is a mention about Native Americans. 
And it says that the Native Americans lived as they believed. Their religion was not different from the way they acted. The Native Americans were kindly people. They were good to their children. Women were well treated. They were kind to one another. It was only in war that the Native Americans were cruel. This is just blatantly false. And this might have a lot to do with the fact that this is a Mormon curriculum and the Mormons definitely have a different doctrinal kind of view of Native Americans as part of their religious history. But I will tell you that this type of rhetoric is what bothers me in the curriculum. There is no black and white here. There was beautiful Native American spirituality. There were wonderful Native American people in the same way that there are wonderful Caucasian people and wonderful black people and wonderful Indian people and wonderful German people, etc. But there were also people who were not wonderful in all of those groups, in any human ethnic group, in any human religious group, etc. And I just don't like blanket statements like this. I think it um, beyond being simply false, teaches your children that the world is black and white again, and the world is not. And I take real exception to that because I prefer to teach my children in at a level at which is, is appropriate to their age, more of the truth. Um, there's no reason to create these sweeping generalizations about a people that makes them sound very um, childlike in a way and um, two-dimensional, which doesn't sit well with me. Those were my thoughts about The Good and the Beautiful Level 3. I hope that this video has been helpful to you guys. I hope that it has helped you decide for yourself as a secular homeschooler or as a Christian homeschooler whether it's uh, the right curriculum for you. And again, my final thoughts on it are that I really like the layout. I think it is beautiful to look at. I like their pacing. I like their academic content. Um, I find the readers to be slightly dull, but my main problems with the curriculum were that the level of Christian doctrine as well as the rhetoric about twaddle just got to an, an untenable level for me. So that's my takeaway. Again, let me know your thoughts, whether you're using it, whether you have used it, whether it's been good for you. And in any case, I hope this has been helpful and not offensive to anyone because that was certainly not my intent. Thank you so much for watching as usual, you guys. I wish you the very best of luck in the coming school year.